Hello, good afternoon. Welcome to Joy News Today. We're coming to you live from our studios in Kukum Lemli. We're on DTT because we're free to on DSTV channel 421 and Go TV channel 125. We are your home of independent, fearless and credible journalism. Coming up this afternoon, sponsors of anti-gay bill fight proposed deletion of clause 4 of their bill, taking out the creation of offence of undermining Ghanaian family values. We are live in Parliament for details. Also ahead, in, ahead of the upcoming district level elections, we get up close with some women, women aspirants who want to end open defecation in Ahimbrunum North electoral area in the Ashanti region. So as the Ghana Independent Broadcasters Association criticized communications minister Deslo Russo for unilaterally charging television stations $15,000 a month or risk shutdown from the DTT platform. My name is Aisha Ibrahim. would we'll also bring you today's episode of Stories of Hope, of an inspiring story of 61-year-old man who is braving the odds and resisting the easier option of depending on his family for livelihood despite his visual impairment. And later in showbiz, South African music icon and lowly way hit maker, Zahara dies at age 36. We're also live on Facebook, YouTube, Instagram and X Spaces at Joy News on TV. My personal handle is at the Nana Aisha. Please stay for details. <laughs> A sponsor of the controversial anti-gay bill is vehemently fighting an amendment to their bill which will delete the entire clause 4 of their bill. Clause 4 creates an offense when a person allegedly undermines proper human sexual rights and Ghanaian family values. Listen to Chairman of the Constitutional Legal and Parliamentary Affairs Committee, Kwame Nyimedu Enchi, providing an explanation for why this is necessary. ...against undermining proper human sexual rights and Ghanaian family values. Though this clause creates an offence relating to undermining proper human sexual rights and Ghanaian family values, what constitutes, quote, undermine, end of quotation, is not defined, and therefore the basis of the offence cannot be determined. Mr. Speaker, this is the advice that the learned Attorney General gave to the committee, and the entire committee agreed on this advice. And that's why we agreed, as have been said by ranking, that it was too much of subjectivity, and therefore we need to end up the duties. And that is why we are proposing that. In deleting and in creating an offence, we shouldn't be having ambiguities and subjectivities. That's why the proposal is that we delete the entire clause. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I've been joined by Parliamentary Affairs Correspondent Kwekwa Sante, who will be telling us more about this. Kwekwa, give us the full rendition of this clause. I shall so close four of this bill sponsored by Sam George and seven other MPs reads. A person shall not a undermine the proper human sexual rights and the Ghanaian family values specified in section two of this act or b directly or indirectly instigate, command, counsel, procure, solicit, or in any other manner purposely aid, facilitate, encourage, or promote, whether by a personal act of presence or otherwise, an act that undermines the proper human sexual rights and Ghanaian family values. A person who contravenes paragraph A or B of subsection 1 commits an offence and is liable on summary conviction to a fine of not less than 1,000 penalty units and not more than 2,000 penalty units or a term of imprisonment not less than two months and not more than four months. This is the rendition of the bill. But as you've been hearing from a sponsor of the bill, um, Roxy Nelson, the MP4, the MP4, North Saudi, he believes that this is a really important part of the bill. And if you delete this, you'll be undermining the significance and the spirit behind the proposals that our sponsors have made in, in, in this. And so 
they want that this clause four is maintained as part of the bill. Listen to Roxy Nelson for make that point on the floor. Mr. Speaker, the essence of is so cardinal to this legislation. So, so cardinal, so, so fundamental to it. I've been struggling to appreciate the point made by the ranking member that this offense, Article 39, is not been able to point it out. There's, there's the subjectivity element that he points to. That too, I am struggling to appreciate because you see, when, when we enact the provision this way, subject to the enhancement contained in the amendments, amendments listed uh, 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 thereafter, there will be investigations. If somebody makes a complaint that clause 4, which subsequently will become section 4 of the law has been breached, that is not the end of it. Investigations will be conducted. It is the investigation that will establish a prima facie that indeed clause 4, subsequently section 4 of the law has been breached or not. So, I, 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 there are similar provisions in other law. Well, the chairman of the uh, Constitutional Legal Affairs Commit uh, Committee says that this, uh, if passed with the clause, will be unconstitutional. Kweku, what was the decision uh, on this? Well, um, I mean, if you came back, argued strenuously that if you add clause 4 of this bill and you pass it, the president may likely not sign it into law because it will be unconstitutional and it may even face a big challenge at the Supreme Court which will lead to the striking out, the complete striking out of the entire bill. And he does not want to see the heartbreak of parliament go in vain, and that is what he wants to do. But ultimately, there was a compromise. Both sides did not agree on deleting it. There were amendments that I proposed severally. But the decision ultimately by the Speaker of Parliament was to stand down the decision on clause 4 until later. So the committee has moved on. They are considering other, other, other clauses of the bill. And clause 4, there's no decision that has been taken on it now. The expectation is that when they get to cost 12, there are certain similarities there. They can merge it and make a decision. Gregoire with those updates from Parliament, you are so certain that we'll bring you more on this from Parliament in our subsequent bulletins. Now, constituents of Ahimbronum North electoral area in the Ashanti region are lamenting the persistent practice of openification, exposing them to high health risk. Community members say assemblymen voted to the assembly over the years have failed to help improve the situation. They believe electing a woman for the first time in the upcoming district level elections can improve the situation. Anita Sewa Ajoga engaged Hawa Mohammed on her chances as a first lady to contest the district level election in that area. Residents at Old Tafo Municipal Assembly bemoan the increasing practice of open defecation in the municipality due to lack of proper toilet facilities. One public toilet serves the municipality. Community members are disappointed with the lack of effort of assemblymen elected over the years to improve sanitation. They are hoping to elect a woman in the upcoming district level election for the first time to improve the sanitation crisis. There is no enough public toilets in this neighborhood or in this electoral area. And as a, as a result of that, uh, open defecation has been, has been going on in this electoral area. If uh, Honorable Hawa Mohammed is elected into office, I know her can do uh, spirit. Because even as her position right now, not even elected as the, any assemblywoman or she's not even having any, any, any portfolio or any position, she's even fighting hard for us to get that as much as more uh, uh, public toilet in this electoral area. Nti ahuchire pa yewa ahuchire pa wa toilet. Papa wa muna uba shware na politi ne egugu wa ni mho. Na politi ne egugu wa yifi en chen chen chen. Ya ni ni di egugu gugu wuhu. For the past eight years, the current assemblyman hasn't been able to curtail open defecation. Now, 
The sanitation situation in Ghana is very poor, with only 25% having access to basic services, about 57% use shared or public facilities, and 18% still engage in open defecation. Poor sanitation conditions pose serious public health risk. According to the World Health Organization, 7,653 deaths in Ghana were caused by wash-related illness in 2019. Ahembro Num North Electoral Area is one of the communities practicing open defecation. Hawa Mohammed, the first lady to contest the district level election in the area, plans to end open defecation at Old Tafu Municipal Assembly. Not having a public toilet, if by the grace of God they vote me into the office, the first thing that I'm going to do is the public toilet for the neighborhood. The Alliance for Women in Media is, however, worried about the low participation and representation of women in Ghanaian politics and governance, despite they constituting more than half of the country's population. Hawa Mohammed is hoping to change the narrative. And the history of Ahimbrunun, even the whole Tafu, I'm the first female who came out boldly to contest the assembly elections. And I'm hoping by the grace of God, I'm going to win, inshallah. For Joy News, Anita Sewa Jogas report, read to you. Well, uh, local government expert Audrey Jakun has been commenting on the apathy that often greets the district level elections. He spoke earlier on the AM show with my colleague Benjamin Akakbo. The local level election is also to do with uh, how we are able to mobilize individuals to uh, go out to vote. If you compare our district level elections to our national elections, you realize that when we are having national elections with uh, Amikavis, our members of parliament and our presidents, you realize that we have an effective vehicle, which is the uh, political parties, to mobilize people to go out there to vote. But we do not have a similar system available at the uh, district level to mobilize people to go out and vote during elections. So I think, in a nutshell, for me, there is no effective vehicle for mobilizing at the local level. That also affects uh, the willingness or the, the or the, the the the. I mean, it affects how people would really want to be part of the process in the election. Away from the district assembly elections, the National Democratic Congress in the Ashanti region has announced plans to hit the principal streets of Kumasi with former President John Mahama to engage the public on the party's 24-hour economy proposal. The policy initiated by the opposition party has received both commendation and backlash since it was announced by the NDC flag bearer for the 2024 elections. Ashanti Regional Secretary of the NDC, Dr. Frank Kamwakohini says the party is optimistic of strengthening the economy with that policy. Nana Bwachi Yadom has more. Former President John Dramani Mahama, during his recent Building Ghana tour, touted a 24-hour economy policy, which he believes will lead the country into economic prosperity. But the policy has received backlash from the Vice President and MPP's flag bearer, Dr. Mahmoud Baumia, who has described it as a policy already in existence. The Ashanti Regional Secretary of the NDC, Dr. Frank Amwakohini, says the party intends to embark on a sensitization campaign to highlight the importance of the 24-hour economy policy. We in the Ashanti region have taken a, a further step to make sure we deepen that policy in terms of understanding and in terms of breaking it down for the people of Ashanti region to know that the policy concerns everyone, every Tom, Dick and Harry in this country. And it is in to solve problems and help resolve all the economic challenges we are facing as a country. So what is this mega event we're talking about? We're going to embark on a retail campaign. And that retail campaign will take a form of a mega walk or procession through the principal streets of Kumasi and all other major towns in the Ashanti region. We are starting on 21st of December 20, 
2023. According to Dr. Mwakohene, the policy championed by the NDC will lead Ghana into economic prosperity. This won't be one of the usual works. As we go about our activities during the work, we'll be engaging with the business community, the market women, the young people on the street, especially the terming unemployed Ghanaians who are on the street and who do not have a hope in this government. We will be engaging them and be explaining how the 24-hour economy is going to provide jobs for them and how the 24-hour economy is going to boost business activities in the Ashanti region and Ghana at large. It is known that Kumasi and Ashanti region is the business hub of Ghana. That is undoubted. But we want to quadruple that effort and help businesses grow and help businesses survive. The NDC is set to embark on what leaders term the mega procession through the principal streets of Kumasi on December 21, 2023. For Joy News, Nana Dankwa Kumasi. Back here in Accra, Foreign Affairs Minister Shelley Ayoko Boche has disclosed the economic community of West African states, ECOWAS, is still continuing with its diplomatic engagement with the military junta in the Niger uh, enclave, urging them to restore democratic governance as evidenced in the two extra summits taken by the bloc. In a speech read on her behalf at a one-day sensitization workshop, she noted the effect of five coup d'etats that occurred within a spate of two years in four countries as being felt by the entire region and beyond. Joy News's Upper West Regional Correspondent Rafiq Salam reports. The regional sensitization workshop on equals protocols for state and non-state actors held in the Upper West region sought to enlighten the participants with comprehensive understanding of the ECOWAS protocols and conventions. Its primary goal is to empower the key stakeholders with the knowledge and understanding necessarily to participate and maximize the benefits accruable from ECOWAS regional integration process. Coordinating Director for International Relations at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, Ambassador Perpetual Dufu, reading a speech on behalf of the Minister of Foreign Affairs, Shelly Ayokoboche noted that the region is at a crossroad of economic development, insecurity, and political instability. That notwithstanding, she averred that steps are being taken to resolve all issues of instability and destabilization in the member states. Sadly, the effects of five coup d'etat experienced by four ECOWAS member states between 2021 and 2023 are heavily felt by the entire region and beyond. In recent days, there have been further attempts to destabilize a fifth member state, that is Guinea-Bissau. As far as mediation and conflict resolution is concerned, ECOWAS has a long history of successfully resolving cases of political crisis, such as the resolution of the civil wars in Liberia, Sierra Leone, and Cote d'Ivoire. The Ghana Independent Broadcasters Association has criticized the Communications Minister Eslo Usu for unilaterally imposing a $15,000 a month charge on television stations or risk being shut down from the digital terrestrial television platform. The Communications Minister, while responding to questions in Parliament yesterday, noted the government will no longer bear the cost of DTT platform warning that media houses will be cut off starting January next year if they refuse to pay. None of the broadcasters on the DTT platform pay for using it as I speak. And this situation cannot continue in our current economic state. Geba is not a broadcaster hosted on this platform. So I don't know in which capacity they would be acting. They have constituent members who are broadcasters on the DTT platform, but none of them have paid a PESWA to date for being hosted on the platform. So it is not correct to state that any entity being hosted on the platform has paid for being hosted on it. They have not. There is actually matters pending in court because 
they have been notified that government has indicated that they, it cannot continue to pay for the operations and maintenance of this DTT platform. And so the users of the platform must pay for the services that they use. That notification has been sent to the broadcasters being hosted on the platform. Some of them are negotiating with the management of the DTT platform as to payment terms for it. Others are adamant that government should continue to pay. But my answer is clear. The government says it cannot continue to pay for it. So if they do not pay for it, unfortunately we may find ourselves in the situation where we cannot receive TV broadcast signals because the platform will be shut down for non-payment of um, the operational expenses that it incurs. It, 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 it is incurring. So I think it's incumbent on all of us to work together to ensure that this critical national information infrastructure stays operational. Reacting to the minister's threat, Giver President Cecil Sunkwa Mill says consultations were not concluded before she went ahead to fix the charges. He spoke on Joy News Desk earlier with me. Uh, we had a list of um, consents. Um, and one was including, it's included the, the pricing regime. Uh, others were the, the absence of a policy for the DTT migration, which would have also catered for the challenge we have today. Uh, the other was the absence of, of a board and a management team, which was actually part uh, of what the draft policy had intended, and also some stations that had been tendered. Um, after that meeting, uh, there was supposed to be a follow-up meeting uh, with the, uh, as per the Parliamentary Select Committee. That was the decision of the day. Uh, but unfortunately, the next day, uh, stations gone, got invoiced uh, on a fee which uh, we, we refer to as arbitrary. And uh, because there was there's a process for setting these fees, and we believe, give our belief that that process has not been followed. And um, so what we had to do in that case, since uh, uh, an invoice and what it meant, uh, put a deadline on stations and pressure. So, uh, unfortunately, uh, Geba was uh, not uh, invited to that meeting, but our members were there. And our members asked the ministry to explain how they came about uh, the figure of, uh, well, it was, a, it was 15 and was discounted apparently to 10, which came up on the invoices. And they asked for a breakdown, which the ministry had said they would share, but they never did. And uh, that's where that's where we are. So we do not even know how they came about the fees. So, but so, um, it's important to note that broadcasters may have other and there are other modes of delivery of of uh, uh, broadcasting in the country. And um, we 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 have an idea of some rates, mm. though they are commercial rates. So. Yeah. A discussion would have solved the problem of numbers. Contractors on the construction of the maternity and children's block of the Confanochi Teaching Hospital are expected to return to site by February next year. The assurance is coming from the Ashanti Regional Minister Simon Ose Mensa during a town hall meeting in Kumasi. According to him, the construction company contractor stopped working due to the government's debt restructuring program. Nanaya Ojima has more in the following report. The first phase of the construction of the maternity and children's block at Konfanochi Teaching Hospital was scheduled for completion in May 2024. Work on the 507 bed capacity project costing 155 million euros started in February 2021 following the demolition of a 45-year-old building over structural integrity issues. Arrangement by the Paris Club for renegotiation of loan facilities stored disbursement of funds for construction of the project. Ashanti Regional Minister Simon Osaimensa says work on the project will soon resume. Actually, the money is not paid in full, it's paid in tranches. Uh, but because the government is now negotiating debt restriction with the Paris Club, for which UK is a member of the Paris Club, that is why the disbursement from UK didn't come through. Now, they've had discussions. The problem is 
almost resolved. And then next year, we are hoping that they will come to site. So the minister spoke at a town hall meeting to update the public on state of health infrastructure in the region. About 25 of 32 health facilities in the Ashanti region are expected to be completed by end of 2024. Works on power installation at the Sewa Government Hospital is near complete. According to the minister, Kumau is completed and Formina is already in use. Other facilities, including five district hospitals and other Agenda 111 projects, will be in operation next year. I tried to answer some of the issues that have been raised. All along, people were saying that uh, the, gov the government has abandoned hospital projects in the region. But as I showed you, none of them has been abandoned. And most of them have been commissioned and are in use. And the few ones that have not been commissioned are also over 95% complete. So we, we are likely to complete all these ones. And even take the VAMED projects. You see, all of them, none of them is below 90%. So hopefully by the end of the first quarter, all these projects will be commissioned. You saw some of the Agenda 11 projects too. All of them, some are, some of them have not even started. Three of them: Sokori Mampon, Kiemi, and uh, Obwasi East. They have not started. They had challenges with access to land. Uh, the rest, some of them are around 85 percent, 80. We have 70, but I'm sure minimum, even though the Health sector people are saying we will, we will commission more than six, but I'm, I want to stick to six. Those that are 60% plus or 70% plus, these are the ones I'm very sure I can see that they will be completed. But if we are able to complete more than the six, it's okay. Meanwhile, the regional health directorate is turning these facilities into specialist hospitals to reduce pressure on the Konfanochi Teaching Hospital. Dr. Emmanuel Tenkran says some of these facilities are already in the process. And all the hospitals that we've finished, we've tried to put specialists in these hospitals. So now when you go to Formula, for instance, we have a surgeon, we have a physician specialist, we have an uh, obstetrician and gynecologist, and then dentist. So anytime we open some of these hospitals, immediately we'll convert them into specialist hospitals so as to reduce the referrals that's going to Confinochi and then the other challenges that we have. Upon completion, the status of health infrastructure in the region will be enhanced. For Joy News, Nanaya Ojima, Kumasi. And in today's Stories of Hope, we'll tell you the remarkable resilience of Clement, a 61-year-old man who has not allowed his visual impairment to hinder his ability to provide for himself. Peter Senu has more. Putiki to Lipi Kukrantumi in the Gwan district of the Oti region where Clement, against all odds, from age 15, is hoping things would turn out better for him someday. He says only two of his other five siblings could see. The rest four of them have had to endure with visual impairment for the rest of their lives. Now at age 61, Clement lives a solitary life in this house. A death trap, I should say, because the mud ceiling keeps dropping off on him due to perforated roofing sheets that leak badly anytime it rains. His companion, this radio set, keeps him abreast of current affairs. Despite his visual impairment, he has over three acres of cocoa farm and at least four ropes of maize farm to his credit. He leads me to his farm. We are in his farm and a cottage, I must add. Before he gets to his farm, there is this dangerous crossing.
Vice President Dr. Mama Dubaomia has launched the Business and Employment Assistance Program to support micro, small and medium enterprises to hire 20,000 youths to reduce unemployment in the country. Speaking ahead of the launch in Sonyang, Dr. Baomia said it is unprecedented the number of people recruited by the government since 2017 and expressed his excitement about the relief the initiative will bring to the beneficiaries and businesses. Precious at the launch of the Business and Employment Assistance Program, a module under the Youth Employment Agency in Sunyai in the Bono region, Vice President Dr. Mahamudu Baumia said the initiative is a response to the challenges faced by small scale businesses to engage in labor retention, thereby causing a surge in youth unemployment. He said the program aims to support 10,000 businesses to engage 20,000 beneficiaries after meeting the set criteria, a move he relishes the relief it brings to the youth. This initiative seeks to assist employers re-employ laid-off workers and retain existing employees by providing a maximum of 500 Ghana CDs per employee as salary support. We are helping the employees who are looking for the jobs and the employers who need people to work but are facing higher costs. So you help them with their salaries, you lower their costs, they hire the people, people get work and we reduce unemployment. Over the next year, an estimated 10,000 medium and small scale enterprises across various sectors are set to benefit from this program. Additionally, 20,000 Ghanaian youth will benefit from the implementation of this initiative. You heard the Vice President Dr. Mahamadou Baomia. Now, the Green Africa Youth Organization, GAYO, a youth-led advocacy group that focuses on environmental sustainability, is urging the youth to take the center stage in the fight against climate change. According to the project coordinator of GAYO, Benedict Fusuatha, the future of today's youth will be in jeopardy if proper measures are not implemented now to ensure sustainability. The group made the call at a three-day Youth Sustain conference aimed at creating a platform to sensitize the youth on climate change and sustainability. Kwesia Daikwating has more. As world leaders gather for COP28 in Dubai to find global ways of dealing with climate change, some youth in Ghana and other sub-Saharan African countries have also gathered in Ghana to brainstorm on local ways of dealing with the menace. The Youth Sustained Conference is an event organized by the Green Africa Youth Organization, which seeks to create a platform for young people, developmental agencies, and researchers to have an intellectual discourse on how best young people can be supported to contribute to urban sustainability in sub-Saharan Africa. Project coordinator for the initiative, Benedict Fosu Arthur, stressed the impact of climate change is not a respecter of persons, hence requiring serious attention. So climate change actually affects all aspects of our lives. There are a number of people out there who do not or might not care about climate change, but one way or the other, it affects them. Our mothers in the house, our grandmothers in the house, our young siblings, they are all affected one way or the other. He therefore underscored the need for youth to take the center stage in combating the menace to avert putting the future in jeopardy. All about climate change, all about sustainability is the youth. Because let's be real here, uh, older folks, if by the natural law, the older folks, they are aging, right? Yeah, good. So whatever the adverse effects will be in the next five years, 10 years, 15 years, 20 years, it will be on the youth. And that is why this mostly here is a youth-led program. The youth should be the ones at the forefront of this fight for sustainability. If you just joined us, we're still live on Join News today. We're coming to you from our studios in Kokum Limli. Let's take a break. When we return, we'll bring you the very latest coming from the world of business.
Hi there, welcome to business. My name is Daryl Kwao. The I2 Development Group has cut sold for the construction of a state-of-the-art facilities at the airport city here in Accra. The project, which is estimated to cost $100 million, aims to enhance Kotoka International Airport's skyline and play a key role in increasing Ghana's tourism sector, um, tourism sector earnings whilst addressing housing challenges. Speaking at the sword cutting event, the chairman of I2 Development, Nabil Al Ahmad, said so the project will play a crucial role in attracting visitors and fostering economic development. The project is a kind of a real estate project, uh, include, uh, including first uh, theme park for the kids. It will be the biggest theme park for the kids. Second, we have uh, apartment uh, for sale starting from studio up to one bedroom, two bedroom, up to penthouse. And also we have something like of uh, of the shops. You can you can say it is like mini mall, not big mall or 600 uh, square meter. Yes, just in Accra. And we had some similar projects of this one uh, in different uh, in different area like Merbeya in Spain. Also we have similar to this, and also in Lebanon we have similar to this. And along with uh, Micheliti, which they used to be our partner from for a lot of project before. As a, as a real estate is the first project in, in Ghana, as a real estate. But uh, other different investment, we have investment with, uh, with uh, we had before some kind of uh, water factory and we had some, we were distributor of uh, mobile phone and electronics. Uh, and we work in the real estate. In the name of the Father, of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. Our patrons of the Capital Market Quiz have described the competition as educative and called for its expansion to cover all second cycle institutions in the country. The quiz, which assesses the knowledge of students on the capital market and its related branches, seeks to improve financial literacy among the youth. Premper College beat Presbyterian Boys Senior High School by 0.5 points to win the 2023 edition. Here's more in this report. The finals of the 2023 Capital Market Quiz competition saw Prempe College, Presbyterian Boys Senior High School, Ya Asantua Girls Senior High School, and Accra Academy battle it out for the converted trophy. After a close contest, Prempe College beat Preseg by 0.5 marks to carry the day. The lads from Kumasi couldn't hide their excitement as they explained that the competition will deepen financial literacy. We attribute all of this to God because it's not normal for a school to do two contests and beat the next school by 0.5. We really believe in the 0.5 and we are thanking God for his help and we also like to thank all those who contributed to this being a success. We are really grateful and we are very happy. To make money, so it begins at the primary stage. So learning about the capital market and about investment, that's the sure way to create wealth. So investment is a key thing. It should be included in what kids should learn. The executive director of Young Investors Network, organizers of the quiz, Kofi Buziache, noted that the next edition of the quiz will be expanded to include other second cycle institutions. Next year, we should expect a bigger, a bigger contest. We're going to rope in the schools in the central region. I know there are a lot of big schools also in the central region. Uh, we're going to rope all of them in. We should expect something bigger. We 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 expect that. Um, the students too would, would appreciate what we are doing and understand that it is not just the competition but it is for us to give them the knowledge in the investment sector and investment industry. Jerry Boachi Dankwa, head of marketing and PR at Ghana Stock Exchange, explained the impact of the competition. I think for Ghana Stock Exchange, Central Securities Depository and Young Investor Network and other partners, it's been very exciting and I think is met our expectations. When we ran this program last year, we actually touched about 5,000 students. This year, as we speak, we've touched over 14,000 students with our financial literacy programs. And we believe that this is the only way that as an exchange we can also contribute to, to this course to ensuring that Ghanaians become financially literate. 
quiz mistress and CEO of Named Capital, Abina Brigidi, shares her experience. The experience was amazing. It was such joy to see that these young girl, young guys and girls knew about the capital market in a way that I never envisaged that they did know. Um, and it was good to see a girls' school represent, and we are hoping to see more of these girls' schools represent next year. The capital market quiz is put together by the Young Investors Network with support from the Ghana Stock Exchange. And that's it for this segment. Sports is coming up next. Uh, on a journey today with me, Muftao Nabila Abla, former coach of the Black Stars, Charles Kablana Kono, has described as an um, un uncomfortable situation for Chris Hilton as media reports continue to suggest that the Ghana FA leadership do not trust him to lead the senior national team to the next edition of the African Cup of Nations to be staged in Cote d'Ivoire. Speaking to Joy Sports, Mr. Kono admonished Ghanaians and the FA to be patient and throw their weight behind him to prepare the team for the AFCON next year. There's more in this report. Before Ghana's World Cup 2026 qualifying matches against Madagascar and Comoros, media reports suggested the GFA was considering parting company with the former Newcastle United manager. Akuno, who was in a similar situation in September 2021 until he was sacked, believes such reports could put pressure on the coach and has asked for the atmosphere surrounding the team to be conducive. I know what he's going through. Um, it's a difficult path. Sometimes you can, you can get confused, especially when the whole nation are at you. you know. Uh, but I think we, there's, we need to be calm. There's, there's a need for calmness whereby we prepare very well, we are focused and have a strategy as to how we can go into, into this tournament. Uh, and so it's a big deal for, for us as a football nation, but we need to calm down and allow him to prepare the team very well adequately so we can go to this tournament and do well. Despite pressure and uncertainty surrounding the future of Hilton, he is expected to lead the Black Stars to Côte d'Ivoire, seeking to end Ghana's over 40 years of unsuccessful attempts to lift the AFCON. CK reckons with the right preparations, the four times AFCON champions will make an impact in the competition. Every tournament has its own way of uh, difficulties, you know, but I think there is a chance for us, like any other team, to go in, prepare very well and, and uh, get, a, get, a, get a cup. <laughs> so, so it's something we can achieve. It's something that we've, we've yearned for it for a long time. Um, uh, there's a need for us, not just the coach, but the people around him also to help and support because it's, it's for us, not for uh, an individual, you know. So I think we should, we should have um, a teamwork, a plan, the other day I heard Kufo is talking about plan and how we can even prepare for this tournament. Sometimes what we normally do, we wait till the last minute and then we are, uh, the planning starts from way back, you know, and we need to prepare very well and get in there. I feel this time around, once we do it, there's a chance for us to, uh, to win, to win a tournament. Ghana is housed in Group B with serial winners Egypt. 2013 group openers Cape Verde and Mozambique. The Black Stars will open its campaign against Cape Verde on January 14, 2024. Tonight, this UEFA Champions League football. Let's bring you the fixtures of the matches that will be happening on Joy 99.7 FM. We'll bring the commentary of the game involving Manchester United and Bayern Munich. These are the fixtures for UEFA Champions League football for tonight. PSV High Noven will come up against Arsenal, the first leg in this contest, and a 6-0 in favour of the Gunners. RC Lons will come up against Sevilla. There's also Union Berlin coming up against Real Madrid. FC Compe Hagen will play Galatasaray. In Milan will play Real Sociedad. Manchester United rooted at the foot of their group will play Bayern Munich and Napoli will play Braha. Real Bus Salbach do come against Benfica. These are the fixtures for the UEFA Champions League for tonight as European football on Tuesday and Wednesday returns. Tonight, enjoy 99.7 FM. We'll bring you a commentary of the match involving Manchester United and Bayern Munich. But we'll have updates of all the matches that will be happening in the other groups as we bring you the best of European football only on Joy 99.7 FM and also on Hit 
103.9 FM. This is our wrap-up sports here on Joy News today with me, Muftar Nabila Abdullah. Up next is World News. Thanks so much for bringing yeah. us showbiz. And that's our wrap of the bullet saying, uh, log on to myjohnline.com. There's more of the news and updates of all the developing stories. Do enjoy okay. the rest. Yeah, let's sign off with our Appalachia Appalachia segment. The Appalachia. Interesting. Do enjoy the rest of our programs. <laughs> <laughs>